good. Okay. Um, for those out of you who don't know, I'm Glenda Carpio. I teach in the English and African American Studies Department, and it's my gr great pleasure um, to introduce Paul Marshall today. Um, and um, I will begin by giving you a bit of a background on her biographical background and then some uh, background on her writing. Okay. Um, Paul Marshall was born Valenza Pauline Burke um, in Brooklyn, New York. Her parents, Ada and Samuel Burke, were immigra immigrants from Barbados, West Indies. At the age of nine, Marshall made an extended visit to the native land of her parents and discovered for herself the quality of life peculiar to the tropical isle. Although she then wrote a series of poems reflecting her impressions, creative writing did not become a serious pursuit until much later in her young adult life. A quiet and retiring child, quote, living her old days first, as her, as her mother used to say, Marshall was an avid reader who spent countless hours in her neighborhood library. This, it seems, was at least a partial escape from the pressures of growing up uh, for the author admits um, going through a painful childhood period in which she rejected her West Indian heritage. Easily identified by the heavy silver bangles which girls from the islands wore on their wrist, she felt even more estranged from her classmates when she returned from Barbados with a noticeable accent. During her early adolescence, reading also helped ease the longing for her father, who having become a devoted follower of Father Divine, left home to live in the Harlem, quote, kingdom. Marshall had been attending Hunter College, majoring in social work, when illness necessitated a one-year stay in a sanatorium in upstate New York. There, in a tranquil lake setting, she wrote letters so vividly des describing the surroundings that a friend encouraged her to think of a career in writing. Upon her release from the sanatorium, which sounds odd, and I always wonder if writers want that much disclosed about themselves. Um, she transferred to Brooklyn College, changed her major to English literature, and, a, and graduated Phi Beta Kappa in 1953. Her first marriage in 1857 was to Kennedy Marshall, with whom she had a son, Evan Keith. She divorced in 1963 and in 1970 uh, was wed for a second time to Haitian businessman Nuri Bernard. Formerly a researcher and staff writer for Our World magazine located in New York City, Marshall traveled on assignment to Brazil and to the West Indies. Once her literary career had been launched, she contributed short stories and articles to numerous magazines and anthologies and began lecturing at several colleges and universities within the United States and abroad. The recipient of several prestigious awards, including the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Fellowship, Marshall continues to write and to teach. She currently is the Helen Gould and Shepherd Professor of Literature and Culture at New York University. While clearly influenced by the literary, by literary, giant, literary giants, both black and white, Marshall attributes her love of language and storytelling to her mother and other Barbadian women who, sitting around the kitchen table, effortlessly create, create narrative art in her informative essay, quote, from the poets in the kitchen, end quote, the author explains the process of the transformation of standard English into, quote, an idiom, an instrument that more adequately describe them, changing around the syntax and imposing their own rhythm and accent so that the sentences were more pleasing to their ears. Um, and she goes on, she says, and to make it more vivid, more in keeping with their expressive quality, they, the women, brought to bear a raft of metaphors, parables, biblical quotations, saying, sayings, and the like. And then she gives an example. She says, um, the women would say, the sea ain't got no back door, meaning that, that it wasn't like a house where if there was a fire, you could run out the back, meaning that it was not to be trifled with, a meaning perhaps in a larger sense that man should treat all of nature with caution and respect, end quote. This is the legacy with, uh, which the artist proudly claims, and she makes of it a distinctive stylistic device which co combines forms of Western origin with the style and function of traditional African oral narrative. In short, she manipulates verbal structures so that they accommodate new patterns and rhythms, and this gives to the written word a stamp of cultural authenticity. Marshall's artistic vision 
evolves in a clear progression as she moves through her creations from an, from an American to an African American, African Caribbean, and finally a Pan African sensibility. Indeed, the chronological order of her publications suggests an underlying design to follow the middle passage in reverse. That is, she examines the experience of blacks not in transit from Africa to the New World, but from the New World towards Africa. Thus, her first major work, Brown Girl, Brown Stones, considers um, the, the coming of age of a young West Indian girl and simultaneously explores the black emigrant experience in America. <coughs> Soul Clap, Hands and Sing, a collection, of, a collection of novellas, is a lyrical depiction of the lives of four aging men coming to grips with the decline of Western values. The, the geographical setting changes from Brooklyn to Barbados to British Guiana and then Brazil. Marshall next, next moves in The Chosen Place, The Timeless People, to an imaginary Caribbean island which on one side faces the continent of Africa. In this epic novel, she traces the development and perpetuation of colonialism. In Praise Song for the Widow, the artist shows increasing reliance on African images as she presents the portrait of an elderly black American widow who, on a cruise to Renata, confronts her African heritage. In her most recent novel, Daughters, Marshall moves her geographical setting back and forth between the Caribbean and the United States to suggest the bicultural ties of her protagonist as well as the political strategies affecting both nations. She further establishes the centrality of women in transforming self, community, and nation. Throughout her fiction, Marshall is preoccupied with black cultural history. Additionally, her emphasis on black female characters addresses contemporary feminist issues from an Afrocentric perspective. She insists that African peoples take a journey back through time to understand the political, social, and economic structures upon which contemporary societies are based. As her, as her vision expands to include oppressed peoples, men and women, all over the world, she develops a sensibility which values cultural differences while it celebrates the triumph of the human spirit. Please welcome me, welcome me in, uh, welcoming Paul Marshall to the studio. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Professor Carpio, for that complete and thorough introduction. <laughs> it reminds me that I've certainly been around for a while. <clears throat> and thanks also to all those in the Department of African and African American Studies here at Harvard who were involved in bringing me to the campus to deliver this year's Alain Leroy Locke Lectures. It's truly an honor to be part of the ongoing tribute to the distinguished life and career of the preeminent Harvard scholar, writer, and philosopher who was the principal architect of the American, African American cultural phenomenon known as the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s. I never had <clears throat> the opportunity to meet Alain Locke. <clears throat> I was fortunate beyond belief, however, to have known his close friend and contemporary, the poet, playwright, lyricist, novelist, short story writer, essayist, autobiographer, anthologist, newspaper columnist, indeed the writer in every literary genre known to man. I'm speaking of course of Langston Hughes, that other towering figure of the Renaissance and of most of the 20th century, in fact. Mr. Hughes was both a mentor and a precious elder friend to me during the early 1960s when my somewhat late start of a writing career finally got underway. As a neophyte, I was extraordinarily lucky to have his friendship and support at a critical stage in my development. So that by way of paying homage to him, for his pivotal role in my career, I have organized these lectures around that friendship. Today's lecture, for example, is a much expanded version of a tribute I paid to Mr. Hughes at a writer's conference held some years after his death. 
while the two lectures that will follow have been inspired by what is perhaps Mr. Hughes' best known poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I've known rivers, my soul has grown deep like the rivers. Those of my generation know those famous lines by heart. Using the poem as a kind of template, the lectures on Wednesday and Thursday will expand on the theme of water, bodies of water, and the critical meaning they hold in African American history and culture. Thus, part of tomorrow's lecture, for example, will focus on a river, not the Mississippi all golden in the sunset, as described in Mr. Hughes' classic poem, nor the Nile or the Euphrates, which he also cites in that poem. Rather, my emphasis will be on the river considered to be the most historic in America, the James River. That is an easy walk, a river that's an easy walk from where I presently live in Richmond, Virginia. I've known rivers then flows into I've known seas. In this instance, it's the Caribbean Sea, which figures prom prominently in my background. And I will speak in some detail of that background and its role in my formation as a novelist. Perhaps I should note here that the three lectures will largely be in the form of memoir and narrative, reminiscence and story, rather than academic treatise or formal lecture. I'm a fiction writer, after all. <laughs> in the third and final presentation, I've known C's, the Caribbean Sea leads inevitably, inexorably, to I've known oceans. And for people of African descent throughout this hemisphere, from Brooklyn to Brazil, as it were, <clears throat> I've known oceans can only mean the Atlantic, the Middle Passage. But before undertaking the triangular route back into history, an homage first to Mr. Hughes. New York, early May, 1965. Some of you weren't born yet. <laughs> the return address <clears throat> on the business size envelope I retrieved from my mailbox read, United States Information Service, United States Department of State, 301 4th Street Southwest, Washington DC 20547. Overwhelmed momentarily by all the wordiness and numbers, I registered only the words department and state, state department, <clears throat> and immediately panicked, anticipating the worst. It had to be bad news of some sort, because why otherwise would the State Department be writing me? Was I perhaps being summoned to appear before a Joe McCarthy type House Subcommittee on Un-American Activities? It was the height of the Civil Rights Movement, after all, 1965, and my involvement on the Northern Front of the struggle had to be known the thing in my hand might well spell trouble. When I finally calmed down enough to open the letter, it proved altogether different. Rather than a dire summons, it turned out to be a once in a lifetime plum of an invitation. According to the letter, the world-renowned poet and writer Langston Hughes would soon be conducting a cultural tour of Europe for the government, during which he would be giving a series of readings as well as talks on black American literature. This was something Mr. Hughes had done for the State Department's Information Service Program, the USIS, on a number of occasions in other parts of the world. Only this time, he had insisted that two young writers of his choosing be included on the tour. And he had named me as one of the writers he wished to take with him. <laughs> Naturally, I stood dumbstruck there for the longest time, the letter in hand. Langston Hughes, none other than the Langston Hughes had chosen me to accompany him on a cultural tour of Europe. Me, a mere fledgling 
with only one novel and a collection of stories published to date. Why would he so much as even consider a novice like myself? Perhaps I should not have been all that surprised. Mr. Hughes was known for the support and encouragement he extended to the generation of younger writers like myself who began publishing in the 1950s and 60s. Gwendolyn Brooks, Lorraine Hansberry, Alice Walker, and others have written of their indebtedness to him. In my case, he had taken it upon himself to attend the book party that launched that first novel of mine, a somewhat standard coming-of-age tale about a girl not unlike myself growing up in a Brooklyn community that was African-American, West Indian, and everything else. The book party, held in a Harlem storefront, was just getting underway when, to the awe of everyone there, none other than the great man himself appeared in the doorway. Mr. Hughes was more than middle-aged by then. The handsome, soulful-looking young poet of the Harlem Renaissance had long been replaced by a rather short and pudgy, rapidly aging, yet nonetheless still urbane man of letters. Every wave of his naturally wavy hair in place. And with a cigarette, his famous trademark of a cigarette, a permanent fixture between his lips. There he was, the poet who had long been a literary icon, come to celebrate with me, come to congratulate me on the positive reviews the book had received, come to beam at me like a paterfamilias whose offspring has done him proud. Speaking of offsprings, I was eight months pregnant at the time, a book and a baby in the same year and produced within a month of each other a feat I never managed again. <laughs> Mr. Hughes also promptly congratulated me and my husband beside me on the upcoming baby. Moreover, months later, when I applied for a Guggenheim Fellowship given the book's reception, Mr. Hughes readily agreed to write a letter of recommendation that I'm sure helped me to obtain the grant. Two years later, 1961 saw yet another instance of his thoughtfulness and support upon the publication of the collection of short stories I mentioned earlier. A postcard arrived from Mr. Hughes, written in his distinctive green ink. This is just about the prettiest looking book I ever saw, it read. It just came in the mail, can't wait to read what's inside, with his large boyish flourish of a signature at the bottom. And when the collection of stories won, a, won an award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, who was the first person at the awards ceremony to come hurrying over to plant a congratulatory, congratulatory kiss a la Francais on either cheek? None other than Mr. Hughes. Indeed, he might well have been instrumental in my receiving the award, perhaps recommending the collection to those he knew on the Academy's selection committee. There's a lot of politics involved in writing. <laughs> the people's poet continued to keep the novice in mind. Would you perhaps be interested in accompanying Mr. Hughes on the tour? The letter. A dumb question if ever there was. The State Department USIS letter then went on to say, that if indeed I was interested, as well as av available to participate in the tour, I would be required to come to Washington to be briefed. Anyone traveling overseas under the auspices of the United States Government Department of State first had to be briefed. What would this briefing entail? What to expect? How much was known of my activities, of my politics? Feeling panicked again, I nonetheless took the plane to Washington. A convicted felon in a Flannery O'Connor short story that I love to teach says of the legal authorities that have finally succeeded in hunting him down, quote, they had the papers on me. Irrefutable evidence 
that is, of his crimes. Such also was my case, I discovered. The authorities in Washington had the papers on me. They were compiled, those papers, inside the very large accordion-shaped folder or dossier, my dossier, that greeted me on the desk in the State Department office where the briefing was being held. From the size of the thing, it had to contain a detailed account of my involvement in every political organization to which I'd ever belonged. From the communist-fringed AYD, American Youth for Democracy, <clears throat> whose cause I had briefly embraced at age 17, <clears throat> to the Association for Artists of Artists for Freedom and Concerned Mothers for Justice, the two groups within the northern front of the movement in which I was most active at present. On file also must have been the transcript of every speech I had ever given taking the government to task, along with a record of every rally, demonstration, protest meeting, and march I had participated in including the first major joint civil rights anti-Vietnam War march that had taken place on a bitter cold day just that winter on 7th Avenue near Times Square. As usual, the FBI, in their London fog trench coats, had been present, openly writing down names and taking photographs from the sidelines, more, more material for the dossiers in Washington. Marching next to me, I remember, was a brother who kept up a fierce whisper of burn baby burn, burn baby burn, burn baby burn, which was the latest anthem at the time of a frustrated and enraged black urban America. His face half buried in the turned up collar of his coat, the man somehow brought to mind Jesse B. Semple, the memorable Harlem everyman and barroom philosopher that Mr. Hughes had created as a newspaper series back in the early 1940s. An angry Jesse B. might have taken Duke Ellington's A-train down from Harlan, mutter his incendiary mantra in the heart of Times Square. Had Jesse B. Semple actually existed, there might well have been a file in Washington on him too. The government officer conducting the briefing turned out to be a middle-aged white woman with the carefully cultivated, neutral manner of a civil servant long on the job. Framed at her desk by LBJ's official portrait and the flag, she began our session by placing a hand lightly on my dossier. Seems you've been fairly active. <laughs> <laughs> Said with a scrupulously neutral little smile after which she then gently pushed the folder aside and began the briefing. She gave first a capsule history of the government's cultural programs around the world, then went on to speak at some length about our particular tour, describing the various European cities we would be visiting and the general nature of our activities. The USIS people in charge of operations on the ground, so to speak, in each city would have a detailed schedule of these activities. On a more conversational note, the woman even offered chatty little tidbits about some of the places we would be visiting. The white nights in Copenhagen could be somewhat disorienting. Complaints about the food in London were unfortunately true. The month of May in Paris usually meant rain, off and on rain, although the city remained beautiful nonetheless. In fact, she said, Paris was to be our base. The tour would begin there, and we would regularly return to the City of Light, following visits to other places on the itinerary. The woman would talk for close to an hour, yet interestingly, she never again mentioned the dossier, that record of my denunciations and actions against the government. She never so much as advanced its way. So that while sitting there, hearing her out, I found myself thinking of Joseph K., Franz Kafka's poor, beleaguered hero in his classic novel, The Trial. With Joseph K., there had been no papers on him, no dossier, 
no record of a single word or action on his part against the state, the government. Yet in the novel, he is hounded and persecuted unto death by a faceless, all-powerful state. Whereas my situation was the exact opposite. With my, while my quarrel, while my quarrel with the, with the U.S. government was a matter of record, viz. the dossier lying between the woman and myself on her desk. Nonetheless, said government was perfectly willing to treat me to a month long, all expense paid trip to Europe with Paris as its base. Surely Washington knew that I would be as outspoken abroad as at home. Why then agree to me accompanying Mr. Hughes? Puzzling over this as the briefing continued, only to conclude finally that the government might actually benefit by sending an emissary, in quotes, such as myself, overseas. The fact that I would be openly critical of its policies could well serve as proof that the country was truly a democracy committed to respecting the First Amendment rights of even its loudest detractors. Washington might come out the winner every time I opened my mouth. The civil servant across the desk obviously understood this. Her neutral yet somewhat flippant comment on my dossier seems you've been fairly active. The way she had then relegated to the side of her desk implied as much. The file might have been trotted out simply to put me on notice that Orwell's big brother was watching and would continue to watch. So be it then. The briefing over, I left Washington without any illusions. I would go on the tour. This once in a lifetime chance to travel with a literary icon. And I would speak my mind about said government when asked, even though my freedom to criticize might ironically, in a way, redound to Washington's good. No matter. Speaking out would be a way of making use of being used, if indeed that was the case. The tour was due to get underway shortly. So that once back in New York, I quickly set about preparation, preparing to leave. First, making preparations and arrangements for the care of my six-year-old son, the book party baby, and then putting aside the novel, my second, that I've been working on for some time. I also made sure to take along the first novel that Mr. Hughes had helped launch. Perhaps I might secure a European publisher for it. Then on the appointed day, still dazed by my good fortune, I took a taxi to Kennedy Airport along with William Melvin Kelly, the other writer Mr. Hughes had chosen. Bill Kelly was another fledgling, a Harvard dropout who had abandoned the study of law for creative writing. He had so far published only one novel and a collection of stories just like myself, both of them very well reviewed. His novel, Bill's novel, called A Different Drummer, was a highly experimental mythic tale about a massive revolt in a southern town. Fed up with racism and a lifetime picking cotton, the entire black population suddenly picks up one day and en masse walks away from the place for good. Every man, woman, and child. They stage a, bibli a biblical exodus, as it were, but not before they pour salt, tons of salt, on every one of Pharaoh's cotton fields in sight. <laughs> Mr. Hughes had promoted Bill Kelly's work as well and had even hired him as a research assistant when he left Harvard to write full time. <clears throat> Our benefactor, cigarette in place, stood waiting for us inside the terminal, a suitcase and a somewhat old-fashioned looking satchel at his side. The satchel, I later learned, held copies of his books of poetry he intended selling during the tour. Mr. Tu Mr. Hughes was every bit 
a wandering bard in the old tradition, but one who also believed in the modern concept of TCB. I had not seen him since the award ceremony at the Academy four years earlier, and he appeared noticeably older, aging like a heavy hand that was steadily and relentlessly bearing down on him. The pressure of that hand, the weight of it, had in no way, though, diminished the cheery, paterfamilias smile with which he greeted us. Neither the aura and authority of his long reign as Black America's Poet Laureate. I can't speak for Bill Kelly, but I felt like bowing down before his royal presence that day in the airport. Rain. I awoke the Sunday morning following our arrival in Paris to an off and on spring rain. Outside my hotel room window, the State Department woman had been right after all. In the large immuble or apartment building across from the hotel, a bored looking woman opened a tall casement window, tossed a cigarette out, out into yet another outburst of rain, and disappeared back inside. On the street below, an exasperated French papa stood struggling with his umbrella and his small son, who was having a full blown temper tantrum at his side. The child screams, desecrating the Sunday morning quiet. A wet, noisy, and inauspicious introduction to the city of light. But never mind, it was still Paris, and I had at last set foot on its famous streets. We were staying in the equally famous Latin Quarter at a hotel named, of all things, the California. As hotels go, the California could not, at the time, have qualified for even a one-star rating. Its small rooms offered little else aside from the bed. Its cramped lobby also served as a breakfast nook, where in the mornings, guests were served a grudging cup of coffee and a single croissant. Worst was the cubicle of an elevator that more often than not was en panne, French meaning out of order, not running. The USIS people in Paris would have secured much better accommodations for us, I'm sure. Mr. Hughes, however, swore by the California. The humble little pension was where he always stayed when in the city that he considered his second home after Harlem. The first phase of the tour quickly got underway with what would become over the weeks an almost endless round of lectures, readings, seminars, panels, panel discussions, colloquia, round tables, round table discussions, and talks. Invariably, each of these was followed by a reception and more talk at the end of an already long day. In Paris, the principal venues for most of the events was the Sorbonne and the American Cultural Center on Rue de Dragon, Street of the Dragon, which was also the USIS headquarters. One large two-day seminar was held outside the city at Royaumont, a centuries-old abbey that had been converted into a conference center. On our first evening at Royaumont, the three of us read from our work in the great stone nave of the Abbey's ancient sanctuary. While the official subject of these events was African American literature, the Q&A sessions that followed were often less about literature and more about the freedom struggle. The progressive-minded young graduate students and scholars in the audience were eager for first-hand, up-to-date knowledge on the movement. They also wanted our opinion on the government's response to the ever-increasing pressure for change. And of course, there was the inevitable question, what were our thoughts on the present state of race relations in America? Although he was the star attraction, Mr. Hughes tended to leave such discussions to Bill Kelly and myself, the Young Turks, as it were and we were only too willing to stand in for him. As for the movement, we pointed out that the principal issue of the moment was a voting rights bill. All efforts were focused at the moment 
on getting Congress to pass a strong and meaningful bill this year, in spite of the opposition from the Southern members of both houses, as well as what was seen as stalling tactics of the President's part. Indeed, I had been among those denouncing LBJ for his inaction at a recent meeting of the Association of Artists for Freedom, a group whose founding members included Jimmy Baldwin, Ossie Davis, Ruby D, Odetta, and others. Race relations, what were our thoughts on race relations? Again, Bill Kelly and I didn't hesitate but spoke in detail about the fundamental racist nature of American society and the political, social, and economic institutions and policies that both sustained and perpetuated it. During these discussions, Mr. Hughes often sat quietly listening while it seems reflecting privately on matters under discussion. He might have re he might have been remembering his own trials and tribulations with the U.S. government. After all, wasn't he the poet whom said government has, had once labeled, quote, perhaps the most dangerous radical in America? Whom it had, this poet, whom it had hauled before Joe McCarthy's infamous subcommittee in the, late, in the early 50s. There, to save his career, it said, the poet had disavowed his socialist communist beliefs. For this, he had been severely criticized, even denounced by many in the black community. He had betrayed Du Bois. He had betrayed Robeson, some declared. All this he had endured only to find himself now being hailed by black America as its poet laureate, and now also being called upon to serve as a cultural ambassador around the world by the same government that had once branded him the country's most dangerous radical. The contradiction, <clears throat> the irony, the absurdity of it all must have accounted for the rueful look on his face at times that read, white folks, black folks, there's no understanding them. Among my mementos from the tour is a photograph in the French newspaper Maris, uh, Paris Match showing Mr. Hughes and myself at a panel discussion held near the end of our first day in Paris. By then, Bill Kelly was no longer with us. Just days earlier, he had received word from the States of an adjunct teaching job, and as a married man with a small child, he had immediately taken the plane and returned home. <laughs> it would be only Mr. Hughes and myself from then on. At any rate, in the Paris match photograph, I can be seen in vain as usual against Washington, while a silent Mr. Hughes sits beside me, chin cupped wearily in the palm of his hand, his glasses slid halfway down his face, and what might well have been his own considerable anger kept carefully under wraps. The Weary Blues, published 1922. In the Paris match photograph, Mr. Hughes appears to embody the title of his very first book, <clears throat> his very first book of poems. Not that he didn't get angry at times. This happened, I recalled, at Africa House in London. London was the second city on the itinerary. The lecture at Africa House followed the same pattern with the official subject of our talk, African-American literature being supplanted almost immediately, almost immediately <clears throat> by a discussion of the Civil Rights Movement. Only this time, the discussion took an ugly turn as a number of the young black Brits in the audience began attacking Mr. Hughes personally. They ignored me. I was unknown after all. I was unknown. And leveled their criticisms solely at him. They accused him essentially of a lack of militancy. Why wasn't he to be seen in the newspapers and on TV in the front line of the marches in the South? Why wasn't he speaking out in the manner of an Amiri Baraka, a Jimmy Baldwin, a Stokely Carmichael, 
seems he was as conservative and as much of a timid accommodationist as Roy Wilkins, Ralph Ellison, and others of their ilk. The weary blues look on his face again. However, it lasted only briefly this time. Instead, seated beside me at our table on stage, Mr. Hughes put aside his cigarette, drew the microphone close so that he could be clearly heard, and began speaking. His voice was calm as usual, restrained, although this time, for the first time, there was no mistaking the outrage and anger beneath the calm. Going on at some length, he informed his young critics that the cultural and political revolution underway in America, in black America, had not begun yesterday, nor would it end tomorrow. He and his generation had done their part, manning the barricades, as it were, walking the picket lines, demonstrating, protesting, advocating, defending the innocent, the Scottsboro Boys, 1931. He spoke in detail about them, nine young black men their age, unjustly accused and railroaded, the fight that had gone on for years to free them. All this happening long before any of them in the audience had been born. Mr. Hughes subjected them to a crash course in early 20th century black American history. And there was monumental work still to be done, he concluded, so that rather than passing judgment, making comparisons, instead of taking a simplistic view of people and events, it was for them, their, their generation, to educate themselves about the complexity of a liberation struggle that fundamentally involved them as well as people of color around the world. A shamefaced silence, suddenly. There was another problem on the tour, that while completely different from the incident at Africa House, increasingly annoyed and finally angered Mr. Hughes. My benefactor loved to eat and drink well, and to do so on a regular basis, needing three meals a day, with each male meal, especially dinner, to be eaten leisurely <clears throat> over good wine and non-academic, non-intellectual, non-political conversation. <laughs> he had had his fill of those conversations over the years and had grown weary. However, the schedule in London, which included nonstop round of activities in the city, as well as visits to Leeds and Manchester, all of this kept us so busy, even more busy than we had been in Paris. We often found ourselves eating dinner so late in the evening, we would be too exhausted and talked out to enjoy it. Mr. Hughes was not pleased. Paulie, he insisted on calling me Paulie, although the E is silent on my name. But who was I to correct him? <laughs> Paulie, these State Department USIS folks are messing with us. Here they got us singing for our supper morning, noon, and night, only to come up short every time on the supper. Radis came to a head one evening on a trip from London to Oxford where Mr. Hughes was to read before the university's illustrious poetry society. Earlier in the day, we had again been kept on the go in London and had gone without a proper meal. So by the time we boarded the train to Oxford late that afternoon, a thoroughly exasperated Mr. Hughes, with me in tow, headed straight for the first class dining car, hungry, we were going to treat ourselves, he declared, to a steak dinner and the best of wine to be had on board the train. There was a queue, however, a long English queue outside the first class dining car. Worse, by the time we were finally seated, then finally served, and had tucked into our steak dinners and wine, there came the announcement that the train was pulling into Oxford. That did it. A still hungry and now angry Mr. Hughes ordered the waiter to recork the bottle of wine. He instructed me to take charge of the food, and we alighted into the august welcoming committee from Oxford, the wine bottle hidden in his satchel of books to sell. 
and with me carrying as distinctly, as discreetly as possible two doggy bags of half, of half eaten steak. Upon returning to our base in Paris for a second round of activities there, Mr. Hughes took the USIS people on Rue de Dragon to task, and the schedule was changed to provide us with regular meal times and more evenings to ourselves. Ever the guide and mentor, Mr. Hughes used those free evenings to introduce me, the little provincial from Brooklyn, to the city's fabled nightlife of bars, cabarets, boites, cafes, nightclubs, brasseries, and more bars. Mr. Hughes had his favorite <clears throat> and saw to it that I had a chance to sample at least a few of them in his company. Then too, <clears throat> a literary agent whom I had met during our initial stay in Paris telephoned me on our return with promising news about a possible French edition of my novel, More Cause for Celebrating on the Town. My initiation was dinner at the legendary Leroy Haynes Soul Food Restaurant in Montmartre. New Orleans, red beans and rice. Honey fried chicken. Greens, real cooked down colored greens. Peach cobbler. We were two happy campers. The restaurant had outlived its namesake and original owner, owner the black American GI who, having fallen in love with Paris while helping to liberate it during World War II, had remained there permanently. Over the years, dinner at Haines had become a must for African Americans visiting the city, as well as for celebrities and musicians, black and white from the States and elsewhere. I'm sure that Mr. Hughes' picture still hangs among those of Billie Holiday, Elizabeth Taylor, Duke, Ellington, and on and on on the walls. During our evenings out on the town, my tour guide proved indefatigable. In fact, as soon as night fell, Mr. Hughes seemed to slough off like so much dead skin, the weariness that would overcome him at times during the day, and to become, as his fellow poet Ted Jones once described him, a man open to people and parties. A postcard Mr. Hughes sent me months later after our tour uh, attest to that fact. Uh, Paris again, brought it along, see if I can, so faded. Uh, Polly, loved finding your letter uh, on my return from a, from a week in Tunisia. This is Tunisia, palm trees. Um, Jimmy Baldwin threw a big spare ribs party for the Amen Corner cast last night, all night. I were there, were W-E-R-E, -E. <laughs> I were there. Fat and deadlines are catching up with me, so guess I better come home. Oh God, God, G-A-W-D, Langston. <laughs> Truth be told, Mr. Hughes was night people. That odd and perhaps lonely breed of humankind who function at their best and are most vividly alive and creative during the hours between midnight and dawn. Realizing probably that I lacked his nine, nighttime stamina and needed my sleep, most evenings my tour guide would escort me back to the Hotel California at a reasonable hour. Ever the gentleman, he would see me safely up the defective elevator, and then the poet opened to people and parties would simply vanish into the Parisian night. In pursuit, perhaps, of his once youthful self, Mr. Hughes would not reappear until morning and his breakfast of coffee and croissant in the California's lobby. Paris, he once wrote, there you can be whatever you want to be, totally yourself. Copenhagen was next on the itinerary with another full schedule of readings and talks. Copenhagen was no gay Paris. 
Indeed, after the City of Light, the Danish capital appeared somber and gray, a heavy medieval gray. What distinguished it, of course, were its white nights, the sky above the city remaining the translucent blue of a freshwater lake from sunset until sunrise. Mr. Hughes took advantage of those pale blue Scandinavian nights to indulge another one of his pastimes, telling stories, reliving the past, still pursuing his youthful self. Once the official day was over and we had had our leisurely dinner and wine, part of the night was then spent in the living room of his suite at the hotel with Mr. Hughes, a brilliant raconteur, re recreating for me the cultural and intellectual heyday of the Harlem Renaissance. The writers, musicians, painters, philosophers, yes, Alain Locke, who were all part of his circle of friends. The small magazines in which he first started to publish, one called Fire, that lasted all of one issue, and Crisis, the NAACP magazine that is still in existence today. I, for one, am a faithful subscriber. He told stories about the literati and the niggerati around Harlem town. He described the rent parties that were popular at the time. He clarified for me the ideological war between W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey, his rival. Mr. Hughes educating and enlightening the fledgling about a culture and intellectual era that had been largely ignored, omitted in the standard textbooks of my day. Then there were the stories about his extensive travels around the world. Mr. Hughes had been a traveling man, no letter G on traveling, ever since he dropped out of Columbia at age 19 and signed on as a mess boy on a freighter bound for Africa. And yes, he did actually throw his textbooks overboard. <laughs> the Big C, I Wonder As I Wander, his two travel memoirs. I had read them as a teenager and inspired by them, had privately vowed all the way back then to emulate their author. Not only would I become a writer, but a traveling woman, no G, as well. During those Copenhagen nights, Mr. Hughes, teacher, storyteller, raconteur par excellence, became something of my personal griot, passing down the richness, complexity, and pain of African American literature, culture, history, all done in a wreath of cigarette smoke while from time to time replenishing a shot glass of gin at his side. <clears throat> a suitable libation for a griot and taken straight, no chaser. Berlin, along with a number of other cities in Germany, was next on the schedule and then it would be back to Paris again. However, I would not be accompanying Mr. Hughes for the next leg of the tour. It was time for me to return home. There was my son's increasingly unhappy voice over the phone. There was, not as well, the increasingly nagging thought of the novel I had put aside. Moreover, I had heard from friends that massive demonstrations were being planned to once again pressure Congress and the President on the Voting Rights Bill. I wanted to be home for that. Mr. Hughes understood. His generation had done its part. The ongoing struggle was continuing with mine. La luta continua. The poet understood as much and would finish the tour on his own. Keeping to the schedule, he flew to Germany at dawn one morning, hours before my flight back to the States was due to depart. And ever thoughtful, ever the gentleman, he left a parting gift for me at the hotel's reception desk. The note that accompanied the gift, written in his large hand in green ink on the hotel's stationery, is another is another precious memento. It's a little frail. Mm -hmm. Hotel Mercure, Copenhagen. Hughes Marshall, last day on the road together, May 29th, 1965. Dear Paul, it has been such fun traveling with you that I would like to do it all over again, at least one more time once. These flowers and these grapes, in lieu of a steak, are to keep you company until you too depart. 
Cherry O, Langston. He still hadn't forgotten our aborted steak dinner on the train. <laughs> <clears throat> I never had the opportunity to travel with Mr. Hughes again. He nonetheless continued to befriend me and to support my work. Along with the notes and postcards he sent from his travels, he also telephoned from time to time when he was in New York. My phone would ring around 11 o'clock at night and I'd know, Mr. Hughes, night people, ostensibly he was calling simply to chat before settling down to work for the night. Actually, the calls had more to do with checking on my output for the day. How did it go today, Paulie? Paulie, Paulie, still calling me out of my name. How many pages did you get done? He was not pleased when all I might have to record, report for the day was a short paragraph or two that had probably ended up in the waste paper basket after being repeatedly revised. A highly prolific, seemingly effortless writer such as Mr. Hughes could not understand a slow pope like myself who could spend hours laboring over a single sentence. Moreover, as someone who thoroughly enjoyed being famous, he was concerned about the effect of my snail's pace on my career. Publish or perish wasn't only true of the academy. The literary establishment was, could be equally as cruel. My benefactor tried warning me in so many words of the obscurity I might be courting in taking so long to produce so little. Once he lost patience with me. Paulie, he said over the phone one night, Paulie, do you realize that I have a book out for every year that you've been alive? <laughs> I was in my mid-thirties at the time. <laughs> you better get busy. <laughs> he certainly kept busy. It said, and it might well be apocryphal, it said that up to the moment of his death in the polyclinic hospital in New York, he was busy at work on a poem. It must not have been going well, because in a rare show, in a rare show, show in a rare show of anger, and with the last of his strength, Mr. Hughes is supposed to have flung paper and pencil across the room. James Langston Hughes, Mr. Hughes. For me, he was a loving taskmaster, mentor, teacher, literary father, traveling companion, tour guide, and a treasured older friend. I miss him. Decades have passed since his death, and I still miss him. A poem of his speaks to the continuing sense of loss, I feel. I loved my friend. He went away from me. There's nothing more to say. The poem ends soft as it began. I loved my friend. Thank you. Um, if you can make them into the microphone, that would be great. Pick up all. Well, mine is really short. Just, I was just curious of the race of the kids. No, no, you got to get it. Let's see if you can record it for a while. It's, it's really kind of minor question. I was just wondering what the race of the kids were who were mad at uh, Langston in London because he wasn't, um, you know, aggressive enough in the... Uh... Black Brits. Black. They were black? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, I thought I mentioned black Brits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when year was that, Paul? Oh, 65? 65, yes, uh-huh. Yeah, there was a fairly large community oh, by then. Yeah. Yes, oh, yeah. yeah. All the Nobody kids. Nobody was black enough. <laughs> <laughs> Mark was black. <laughs> Thank you for that beautiful uh, remembrance. There have been some uh, great books written uh, about the life of Langston Hughes. Are you planning on writing one? No. <laughs> I just, I was just eager to try to caption, capture a brief period. Uh, and to give a sense 
a more sort of complex sense of the man. You know, I didn't want to get involved, and I know there have been wonderful, um, you know, sort of biographies done of him and studies and so on, all of the facts, all of the dates, all of the long listing. I just wanted to give a flavor and sense um, of the man and his complexity. Uh, nothing more ambitious, ambitious than that. But uh, my sense was that Langston would have liked to know that people could kind of see him in a more complex way. Uh -huh. That's exactly why I feel so special. We're a very special group to have this personal uh, giving and sharing that, you're, um, that you've chosen to give to us today and the rest of the time to give us this sharing of Langston Hughes in your life? Well, I think it's important because uh, how does one sort of establish, how, how does one get to the point where you're sort of brave enough to, to commit yourself to being a writer? It's really some of the people who have uh, walked that path before you and who are willing to risk it and who are willing uh, to, in a sense, <clears throat> whose commitment is total. I mean, that was one of the reasons that Langston, maybe he did back down when he went before that House Un-American Activities Committee, because he didn't want anything that was going to, in a sense, prevent him from being able to write, to write and to carry on with his work to move about the world. He had seen what this country had done to a Robeson, took away his chance for him to function as an artist, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so uh, uh, Langston was you know, committed to, to his art. And I needed at that point, because I was getting kind of objections from any number of quarters, including my family, my mother would say, books? Write in books? Well, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, and that's it. Yes, and she knew, the, she knew the job also. The telephone company had just started hiring Colin. She said, get yourself downtown. <laughs> you know, and so I needed the Langstons, and they were just priceless to those like myself who had really committed ourselves to the course, to stay the course. Mm -hmm. That advice was right. Yes. You had a better chance being a colored operator than being Paul Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God that you were hard headed and did the right well, thing. That's it. Hard head, own ways, etc. I'm going to talk right. about that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I was pretty much moved by your as a lecture, by your style of speech. It has just moved me a lot. So the year when you visited those European countries, mm -hmm. uh, it was the year when uh, Malcolm. Uh, X was assassinated. Were there any questions uh, related to his uh, assassination when you visited, like, London? Well, he was assassinated in 65. 65, that right. That was just, just in February of 65. Uh, and so we went there, you know, to not only talk on this Broadway about race relations and so on, but also about Malcolm, you know? I mean, another person destroyed. Uh, for example, when uh, Malcolm X uh, wanted to uh, visit uh, France, he was re rejected at the airport. Mm -hmm. And was there any reactions to that from the French audience? Uh, Not that I recall. Uh -huh. Not that I recall. Uh, when, when was that? When he was... Uh, 65. 65. 65, just before he mm -hmm. was assassinated. Yes, yeah. Well, I guess the French government. Right. I guess the French government was taking their orders from, you know, the, the State Department. Mm -hmm. Is, Absolutely. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Paul, you've been a wonderful mentor to myself and so many other writers. Um, when I'm thirsty, I call you up, and I'm always shored up. I'm, when I'm angry, when I'm mad, when I'm sad, when I'm glad, I call you, and you always shore me up. I wanted to know if Langston gave, what was the best um, piece of advice that Langston gave to you that you could sort of pass on to us or as we continue to, in our struggle to? His, his, his life was that example, his total, absolute commitment to the work, to writing. 
I mean, he was, I mean, I, I'd like to believe that story of him there in the polyclinic hospital, of riding up to the very last moment. That was his life. And I think you have to have that kind of example because, as I said before, there's so much in life, in the people around you, that can defeat, that can defeat that commitment. It's an awesome kind of commitment. And so that is his great worth. That was his great worth to me. Uh, also, the complexity of the man, <laughs> you know? Yes, he worked hard, but he party hard. <laughs> you know? uh, uh, and he was sad at times, profoundly sad. So he was this wonderful, complex human being that I had the privilege to be with day after day for close to a month, which was an extraordinary experience, yes. Thank you so much for your words and your work. You have inspired me for years, as Thank did you. Langston Hughes inspire my father, and thus also me. I grew up with Simple oh. and his stories. Yes, yeah. So my question to you uh, picks up on your last comment. After HUAC, was Langston Hughes sad? Did he break? How did his mood shift? Mm -hmm. Was he closer to Simple, or was he closer to Bert Williams? Okay. So yes. what did you pick up in the nuances of his life as you spent a month with him? Where mm -hmm. was he? What happened to him? Um, I think he was, first of all, absolved, as he saw it, because that's the way folks be. Here they were ready to, you know, string him up because they felt that he had betrayed Du Bois. How could he do that? Why didn't he remain as steadfast in his commitment to the party, to his experience uh, when he was in Russia, when he became, Langston became, so taken with uh, what he saw was um, a, a more, a, a society where there was no racism, there was no anti-Semitism and so on. Um, so that he was, he was able to understand that on one hand they would uh, denounce him, on the other hand they would embrace him, and that he could, he could manage the two of them because he had his work. That sustained him through all of the shifts in the wind and all of the shifts in attitude and opinion and so on. He had the work, and that's why he worked so much and produced so much. I mean, that's the thing that essentially kept the man going. He wrote all the time. I couldn't do it. You know, I have periods when uh, I, I, just, I just can't work. And yet he just, is, <clears throat> it was amazing <clears throat> that he could do all of that and, just, and also manage to get around the world. How can you, you know? Paul, let yeah. me ask a question. And Bella, I'm not going to get up and get up the microphone. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, Langston Hughes concludes that essentially, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Honor Rampasset concludes essentially Langston Hughes was asexual. Asexual? Yeah, that's in uh -huh. two volumes of biography. He basically says that, that he was asexual. The gay community, of course, claims, you know, you walk by any gay bookstore in Langston Hughes, in Black History Month, mm -hmm. in the winter, right? Oh, uh -huh. Langston Hughes. <coughs> Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you had, I mean, I, you know, obviously we don't care if he was gay or not. I'm just wondering if you had any opinion about that. Well, not really. I just, I just kind of showed some of the bars that he took me to. Some of them were gay bars, you know, and there was the fact that he was gone all night and he wasn't taking me along with him. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, <laughs> But I was respectful enough yeah, right. not to ask questions or even to ask myself questions. Sure. You know, that was just you some... You never even occurred to you? No. Well, of course it occurred. Thanks. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yes, he did, but he didn't ask me about yeah, that. But he does sort of pussyfoot around that whole issue in the, what yeah, I, in yeah, the, sure in the biography, you know? Huh? Who? Oh, oh, she did? Yes, yeah. 
Yeah, well, you know, Langston would not have, uh, Langston would not have just, he wouldn't even have dealt with it. If you came up to him and say, you know, are you this or that, he wouldn't even have answered. I mean, he just, those were things about himself and his life that were private. I mean, it, well, I mean, this whole, this whole thing in Tunisia, these lovely boys in, in this, in this car, you know. <laughs> but you respect it, and you don't, you don't intrude and ask but questions. Jimmy Baldwin was breaking the mold by. Oh yes, but that was his style, yeah. and Langston would have respected that style, right. but that was not his. No, right. okay. That was not his. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not judging for that. Mm -hmm. It's just time for the record. To oh, it's, yes, he would love the fact that there's this kind of ongoing sort of <laughs> is he or is he not? Or, you know, he would he would love it. Anything that kept his name out there. He loved fame. Well, he doesn't have to worry about that. No, I know. Well, Professor Gates tried to uh, preempt my question. Oh, no. uh, I was going to go in that direction. It's something that I'm extremely interested in, and we're gonna, I'm going to be uh, pressing that issue probably for the next three days. So I'm uh, glad we began it now sure. so we can uh, free me up to ask something else. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you first for this wonderful narrative that you weave for us, and I, I really appreciate uh, especially in this context where uh, beautiful language uh, is so often secondary to beautiful ideas and people don't realize the two have to go together. Uh, and so it's good to get. I think the standing ovation was partly because of uh, uh, a welcoming back of beautiful language uh, in this place that's uh, uh, so, so lax it so often. Uh, except in our department, obviously. Um, <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask you uh, about the relationship between uh, culture producers in different sites in the uh, what's conceived of as the African diaspora. And what I mean by that is um, finding a way uh, to think through the different influences. And you, talk, you spoke uh, about your personal relationship with uh, Langston Hughes, um, and that being emblematic of uh, a larger relationship across the diaspora, movement of these bodies across bodies of water um, that uh, created black cultures uh, in relationships to each other, so that it becomes almost impossible to conceive of um, an African American cultural identity um, that is not also related to, um, and not to say that it, it's uh, borrowing from or uh, in some way reduced to being a subsidiary of um, an Afro-European uh, cultural identity, um, which is also in relationship to um, an African identity as conceived of and on, on the continent, um, in also in relation to an Afro-Caribbean identity, so that these things, it, becomes, it gets very easy um, to talk about them as if they exist autonomously, um, but that once you begin to really feel through the relationships, Langston had, uh, went to Cuba and uh, a few times and um, had a really close relationship with uh, Nicolas Guillen. No, no, but so that's my question. So my question is, um, how do we get to a place when we can begin to talk about these kinds of relationships and have them really critique um, the kinds of ways that we think about black cultures in the diaspora? But the, the relationship that, see, that seems to uh, sort of disperse <laughs> African intellectuals, African cultural traditions into their own pockets. So this is Afro-European, this is Afro-American, and these things don't come into contact, they don't meet, um, they exist separately, and then we hear about the contact that has happened and that's created them together. Uh, I'm not a good person to uh, really speak to that because uh, the whole intent and thrust mm. uh, of, of my work <coughs> has to do with that larger sense of our experience. Uh, <clears throat> the only way I can, uh, let me give you, let me just give you an anecdote as, as to how I got there. Um, one of our great writers, Tony K. Bambara, beautiful short story writer, novelist. Uh, Tony and I were invited up to Dartmouth to celebrate, um, to commemorate uh, Grace Paley, an outstanding writer, very political. And um, because Tony Cade and myself were the only two blacks in this group of writers who were celebrating grace, <clears throat> they felt, since it was Dartmouth, that they should um, have the two of us meet with the few black students who were there at Dartmouth. Uh, and so, yes, we met with them. 
And uh, one young woman immediately said to me, uh, well, you know, sort of uh, not in this bald way that I'm putting it, you know, kind of why, why are you here mm -hmm. seeing me as, uh, in her mind, as a West Indian writer, mm -hmm. uh, as someone who was not part of the <coughs> African American tradition. This was, uh, well, Tony, let's see, Tony's been dead now for about uh, four or five years, right, yeah, just as recently, really. Um, and Tony got hot, she, she anticipated me, she really got so annoyed, and she said, okay, Paul, don't you, just let me answer that for you, okay, well, you know, you don't say no to Tony, right? right? <laughs> and she said, one of the things you've got to understand about my colleague and friend is that she is a writer of the diaspora. Mm. That for me, I cannot disassociate or separate my experience as a black American, as a West Indian American, mm -hmm. from the West Indies, from Africa. Mm -hmm. That the whole thrust of the work, certainly that last, that, that most recent novel of mine, mm -hmm. has to do with that. That's my vision. Yeah. Now there are a lot of people out there with very different visions, and you know, I have to respect that. Yeah. But I'm trying to promote mine. And I agree with yours. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Is there a final question from anyone? Okay, well then let me if thank not, you. Let's thank